Every once in a while, you got to do something in church to make people talk about you. So I, my children are going to be talking about me all week. <laughs> but that's all right. That's all right every once in a while to do something in your worship and make them talk about you. If you, got a, if you have the kind of praise that no one ever talks about, it doesn't, it doesn't bother anybody, then you, then you need to pray some more until they start to talk about you like they did David. David would worship God and people would start to talk about him. We're not doing it under men, but the praise means that we act, the Bible says, a clamorously foolish. God will not be without a hilarious worshiper. And so, uh, some of us, we were fools for the devil. But the Apostle Paul says, I would rather be a fool under Christ uh, than to sit there and live in what the world calls wisdom. And so we are excited this morning. Amen. I'm excited to minister God's word, and I believe the Lord is going to speak to us in this time that we have. Let's go before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, once again, we come boldly before your throne of grace that we might obtain mercy, find help. And we need help. We admit it. We're not ashamed to say it. We need help, but we thank you that the Holy Spirit is our helper. And you lead us and you guide, direct us into all truth. And the truth shall set us free. We shall know the truth and the truth shall make us to be the free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so I speak liberty right now in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, well, join me in John chapter 18, verse number 28 is where we're going to begin. And uh, I'm going to continue part two of the message we started last week. Here comes the king. Here comes the king. In John 18, Verse 28, it says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. And it was early in the morning, but they themselves did not go into uh, the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke signifying the death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. When we talk about here comes the king. I like to look at this passage. I like to look at this teaching from Pilate's perspective. And what we're going to do today is we're going to have a conversation, have an interview, so to speak, and we're going to ask some very pivotal, pivotal, pivotal questions. Oh, my goodness, my children are going to ride me again. They can't wait till this service is over. Every time I miss a syllable, they, they, they jot it down. Anyway, moving right along on this Resurrection Sunday, asking some very pivotal questions to Jesus. 
And we're going to ask these questions for ourselves. And I believe these are very significant questions that deserve an answer in your life. And so, in this discussion, uh, Pilate serves as the interviewer. And we're going to step into those shoes and ask these questions and hope to gain understanding. And I said, here comes the king. Now, I want you to put yourself in the narrative of the scriptures. And I want you to see Jesus had, uh, a few hours ago, had been praying. And he was praying and his sweat was as drops of blood. It was so intense as he was going before the Lord. He asked his disciples to join him in prayer. He asked his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, if they could tarry with him in prayer, continue with him in prayer for just one hour, one hour of prayer. And they couldn't do it. They fell asleep. When they fell asleep, they woke up to find one of their own, Judas, uh, who was uh, considered a zealot. He was one that wanted uh, a political takeover. He wanted a Messiah to show up in power and take over the Roman government that was oppressing them. And so they're coming out of this prayer. Well, this it was a prayer meeting that they were asleep. But when they woke up, they see Judas, one of their own, coming to betray him. G Judas is coming and he betrays Jesus, Jesus with a kiss. And Jesus, he turns to him and says, friend, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? He brought all the religious leaders he'd already plotted beforehand to see how he might uh, betray him and how he might turn Jesus in. And of course, they wake up, they're startled, all these soldiers are there, the religious leaders are there, and Peter had just told Jesus, look, I am your man, I will never depart, man, you my dog, I got you. That's Peter. Peter takes out his sword, goes for the head, and I guess the servant ducks and he slices off his ear, and Jesus is like, man, Peter, uh, stop it, put away, Peter, you're embarrassing me. <laughs> If I wanted to fight, I got 12 legions of angels. Now, one angel in the Bible took out 185,000. Uh, a legion was a minimum of 2,000. So there were 12 legions. Now, we see one of the angels that was guarding the garden with a flaming sword. And when they saw that angel, no one wanted to go toward the tree of knowledge of good and evil or the tree of life, per se. So Jesus says, I got 12 legions that are just waiting for me to give them the sign and they will wipe out all of humanity for messing with me. Put away your sorry sword, Peter. You can't help me. And so they arrest him. And this is the setting that we see the biblical text. Jesus is coming few days before, he was on a donkey and everyone was hailing. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, how the crowd can change. Jesus is now coming, looking like a common criminal. And as Pilate sees this man coming, I want you to put yourself there. He's seen this person that he doesn't know and he doesn't realize this is the king of kings. This is the Lord of Lords that is coming to him. Some of you are in that same position right now that Pilate was in, and you don't recognize the one who is coming to you. Maybe you expected God to come in a different way, but Jesus is right now coming to you, and he's coming to your life in a way that you might not Expect it. And Pilate, like anyone, asks questions. Some of you, even now, you have questions concerning God. You have questions 
about his love. You have questions about things that God has allowed. You have questions about where you fit. Why are you here? What is this all about? Pilate has these questions. And the first question is a question that we all must answer in our own hearts. Pilate asked, basically, who are you? We see it in verse number, uh, verse number 33. Pilate asked Jesus, are you king of the Jews? In other words, who are you? Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? That's a question that we have to answer in our hearts. Who is this? Uh, Because based on who we perceive Jesus to be, that is going to determine how we respond to him in life. If we see Jesus as a cute babe in the manger, okay, he's not going to do anything. He's no... If we see Jesus as some type of pacifist, then you're just going to continue to live your life however you choose to live it, and Jesus is a nice person on the side. I like what C.S. Lewis said in addressing this because you start to talk to people about Jesus, they have all kinds of opinions. You talk to somebody and say, yeah, I I believe Jesus was a great person. I believe he was a, a great prophet. He was a good man. He was a good person. He did a lot of good works and he had a, he had a very positive message. You ask people who Jesus is and they'll tell you all kinds of things and usually they'll tell you good things and they'll say, you know, he, he, he rocked the boat or he ruffled some feathers and that's why uh, for political reasons and so forth they killed him. But when we start to probe, who is Jesus? Who really is Jesus? We can't say he was a good person if we're not willing to finish it. We can't say he was good if we're not going to address the fact that he was the son of God that Jesus is the second person in the Godhead, that Jesus is the eternal son of the living God. If we're not willing to go there, don't try to say he's a good person. I said, see, was he, he talked about this, and I, I want to read what he said in response to who is Jesus. He says, I'm not trying here to prevent anyone from saying, I'm, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people, people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can, you can, spit, at, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with a patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And that's a quote from C.S. Lewis. Jesus has to be revealed. And the way we live our life is based on who we see Jesus to be. I want you to know this morning that some of us just know Jesus in our heads. We have 
over the years gathered some facts and they are in our head about who Jesus is. And we live our lives based on who we perceive Jesus to be. But if we're going to know him, the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 1 verse 15, that it pleased Almighty God to reveal his Son in me. Unless God reveals who Jesus is, you will live your life like Pilate and not know him. Pilate did not know who was walking with those soldiers and religious leaders. He didn't know. You know, there's an interesting uh, movie that I enjoy, so I'm just going to put my stuff out there. Uh, I like spy movies, and uh, there's this character, some of you guys, I'm sure you don't know who I'm talking about, Jason Bourne. You don't know anything about him, but that's all right. I'm just, it's my story. Uh, and so I, I'm a fan because I just like people who whoop folk up. Uh, and so I remember I was watching this uh, movie about Jason Bourne, and something went down. And now the whole U.S. government is looking for him. He's a spy, and everyone's looking for him, and they're looking at him to try to kill him. And he's like a $30 million spy. I mean, they invested everything to make him a killing machine. And so he goes to this passport agency or this U.S. embassy in another country. Now, the U.S. government is looking for him. And he shows up and turns in his passport, and they sort of red flag him, and they put him in uh, some, you know, detention or uh, some room to detain him uh, while they interrogate and find out exactly who he is. And you have this petty officer that is, is trying to interrogate the most dangerous man on the planet and has no clue. And as soon as his name comes, it triggers to the CIA or, or it goes to the Pentagon, CIA, and they realize, wait a second, Jason Bourne, who we're all looking for, is, is, is sitting there, and he's, he's in some detention room. And so the guy makes a call. He says, yeah, I got, this, I got this dude named Jason Bourne in, in the room. And they're like, hold up. Uh, this guy is a top priority. This guy is danger. This guy is uh, a number one priority, whatever. And you can see him. He, he, he's trembling on the phone. And Jason Bourne is just waiting for this to happen. And, you know, they have soldiers, everybody's standing there. They don't know who they're dealing with. And as soon as uh, he puts down the phone and tries to, because he was talking big at first. He's like, all up in his face, you're going to pick ball. You're going to talk. We're going to make you talk. And he's just sitting there knowing that he can kill them all in about three seconds. And so when he puts the phone down, then Jason Bourne, he just does his business and you know, karate chops the back of his head and knocks him unconscious, him and the soldier. Uh, but that's how we sometimes deal with Jesus. When we don't, this is Pilate talking to the king of kings. And he's talking rough, he's talking big and bad, and he has no idea who he's dealing with. Pilate even gets kind of bold to start talking about power. Can you believe this? He's talking to omnipotent power himself. And Pilate is saying, Jesus, you know I got power? Jesus, you don't know me. Hold on. Let me tell you, I am Pilate. I am the prefect of the region of Judea. I'm Pilate. I got power. If I give the thumbs up, you all right. But if I do like this, Jesus, I'll take your life. Now, the whole time Jesus has been quiet. He hasn't said nothing. Until Pilate starts talking about power and Jesus has to respond. <laughs> oh. Jesus is like, hold up. 
<laughs> Hold up. The only reason you have power is it because it was given to you from above. Now, Pilate is just thinking, you know, Tiberius Caesar, who empowered him. That's all he's thinking about. But Pilate uh, doesn't understand anything about Romans uh, 13. He hasn't read Romans 13. It hasn't been written yet. Where uh, it's God who puts those who are in authority in power. He hasn't read and understand that God raises up one and puts down. A, he doesn't realize he's talking to the person that put him in that position. Doesn't know. Same way sometimes when we deal with the person of Jesus Christ, we have no idea who we're dealing with. And that's why we act the way we do. That's why we can talk to people the way we talk to them, because we have no idea who we're dealing with. We have no idea that we're going to have to give account for every word that we say. And so we just talk junk because we don't realize. When Isaiah was in the presence of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6, all of a sudden he realized who he was dealing with. And when he realized, he said, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm in trouble because my eyes have seen the king. Pilate asks another important question. Another important question we, we see he asks. And he asks him, where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you from? Uh, you see it in John 19, verse 8. It says, therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, they had just said, this man claims to be the son of God. When Pilate heard that, he was afraid and went again to the praetorium and said, Jesus, where are you from? Now, the reason why Pilate is acting this way, normally, if a person says they're the son of God, then you just discard that person as crazy. But you're not going to get all these Roman soldiers and all these high priests coming and treating this man as a serious threat. And Pilate knew they were jealous of his influence and power. All of these people are making a big deal out of someone who is seemingly making a crazy statement. So all of a sudden he's afraid. Now his, his wife has been dreaming and says, don't mess with this man. Wait a second. Where are you from? Uh, you, you, you and I, we, we have to ask this question concerning Jesus because it's going to give us a perspective of where he's from. It's important that you and I know where Jesus is coming from. It's important. Uh, in John 1, 18, we see that uh, Jesus is in the bosom of the Father. We see that the word in John 1 uh, was God and was involved in creation. Where is he coming from? He's coming from eternity. Uh, it's not only where he's coming from, because the Bible says uh, he's coming, he's the very beginning. He's the one that started time. We're knowing who we're dealing with right now, because sometimes we can look at the moment and forget that God is eternal. We can look at the hard time that we're going through right now and forget the perspective. We forget the one that we're dealing with, where he's coming from. You're having a little problem right now in time. Uh, maybe you just lost your job. Maybe uh, someone has said something wrong about you and you're getting all bent out of shape uh, because something is happening to you in this moment. But when you understand where Jesus is coming from, from the place he sits, he's able to say that all things work together for good for those that love God and for those that are calling, called according to his purpose. It's a different perspective. Where are you coming from? Uh, Jesus, uh, he is coming. He is fully God 
and at the same time, fully man. The place where he's coming from is a place where he's able to identify with what you are going through. He was in all ways, all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus understands. That's why uh, no matter what you're going through, he's able to say in Revelations, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Hallelujah. He that begun a good work will finish it. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Where is he coming from? Uh, he's coming from the scriptures which foretold that the seed of the woman will destroy uh, the serpent's head, will crush the serpent's head. Where is he coming from? He's coming from the prophet Isaiah that says a root is going to come out of Jesse. A root out of David is going to come. There is a Messiah that is going to come. Where is he coming from? Uh, he is coming in the fullness of time according to Galatians 4 verse 4. In the fullness of time God sent forth his son born of a Woman. Uh, he is the son of God, but yet he is called the son of man. Hallelujah to his great name. I'm glad that we're serving a God that understands what I feel. Uh, he identifies with my pain. He identifies with my suffering. He says, I've been there. I've done that. Hallelujah to his name. And guess what? You might say, you know what? This is good preaching and all, but I have, I, I have gone through death. I'm dying on the inside. My hopes, my dreams, my aspirations, they've all been crushed. This is not the life I wanted. This is not what I signed up for. I feel it's all pointless. Jesus, where he's coming from, he's coming from a place of death. He's faced death itself. Uh, and he's defeated death. He says, I hold the keys. I am he who was dead. Uh, Hebrews 5, verse 8. Where is he coming from? Uh, the Bible says uh, how God uh, dealt with Jesus and Jesus uh, through strong cries, uh, through his suffering. Uh, he learned obedience and he learned to call on him uh, which was able to deliver him from death. He called on the one who was able to deliver him from death. Are you dying on the inside? There is one that you can call upon when you know who you're calling. He's able to deliver you from death. You don't know how to come out of death. You don't know how to defeat its finality. You don't know how death could ever be swallowed up in victory. But Jesus comes from death, comes from victory over death, hell, and the grave. Do you know who you're calling on? Do you know who you're dealing with? Do you know who is before you? He is the risen son of God. Final question. Provocative question that Pilate asked in, in John chapter 19. I'm sorry, not John 19. He really brings it out in Matthew 27, 22. And this is the question that all of us have got to answer. Matthew 27, 22. Pilate then said to them, what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? In this instance, you're Pilate. And you've got to ask and answer that question for yourself. What are you going to do? Are you going to have church? Are you going to go out about your business and about your life and be a good person? Do the best you can and count on your goodness to save you. Are you going to rely on the prayers of your grandmother and trust that her prayers are going to answer that question for you. It's not what is your grandma going to do with Jesus. It's what will you do? 
You have to answer that for yourself. What shall I do? You have to, that has to be your question. You are the interviewer here. What am I going to do? You can do nothing. That's your choice. You can do nothing. Some of us, we like doing nothing. We're used to doing nothing. And God gives you the freedom of choice to do nothing. What shall I do? Ha. Huh. I hear my, my dad's voice. I hear him in my head with this question, quoting uh, one of the songs, the hymns that he used to sing. What will you do with Jesus? Neutral, you cannot be. Someday, your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? What will you do with Jesus? Neutral, you cannot be. Someday, maybe, maybe you don't feel like it right now, but someday, your heart is going to ask, what will he do with me? What are you going to do about Jesus? What are you going to do about the King of glory? How are you going to live your life in light of who he is? Uh, the resurrection settles the issue. The resurrection separates him from any great man or woman who's lived in human history. No one can talk like Jesus that says, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to raise it again. How do you respond? What are you going to do uh, when the king is standing before you? The first thing I would recommend is that you fall on your knees in reverence. It's kingdom protocol. Uh, in the glory, in the heavens of heaven, there are mighty beings, there are angels, there are seraphims, they're actually literally burning ones. There are angelic beings that are literally on fire. They're on fire like the burning bush is on fire, but it doesn't burn. There are burning ones, seraphims, mighty beings. Uh, they stand in the presence of God. You, you, you see, again, you got to know uh, where, where Jesus is coming from. Uh, when you know where he's coming from and you know who he is, you are going to respond to him different. You're going to worship him differently. Uh, even when Gabriel, Gabriel is not Jesus. Uh, Gabriel is not one that demands worship. But when Zacchaeus, uh, Zacharias uh, said, uh, how are these things going to be? You're telling me I'm going to have a son and I'm an old man and my wife is old and we're a uh, pastor child bearing. Gabriel says, do you know who I am? And do you know where I am? I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. You don't know. I've come from heaven with a word and you have a, you turn around and try to doubt me. Uh, when you know who Jesus, you can't live in doubt and unbelief. Uh, we're, we're confused. We're asking questions. We're doubting God. We're questioning God's goodness. We're questioning God because you don't know who he is. He is goodness. He is love. Uh, we have no idea, and God wants our eyes to be open. Uh, with him, the Bible says in Hebrews 4, 13, with him we have to do. With him, the person, the one that we have to give an account to. Uh, you are dealing with the God of the universe. You are dealing, and I'm dealing with the king of glory. Uh, lift up your heads. When you see the king of glory, what do you do? You fall down to your face, and you worship him. The wise man when they found him, uh, they said, uh, we have come to Bethlehem. Uh, where is he, king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east and have come to now to Jerusalem. We've come here to worship the king. When they found him, uh, they laid down their gold, their frankincense and myrrh, and they began to worship him. How can you be so cool when it's time to worship? How can you be so dignified? How can you be so into yourself? Ah, the Bible says, in the house of God, they shout glory. You can't see the king of glory and be casual. When the angels are in his presence, the Bible says they cried one to another. In the presence of God, the king of glory, the king that sits on the throne, they cry out one to another. They're talking to each other. In church, we got to talk to each other sometime. And they're talking to each other and they're saying, he's holy. And another was saying, he's holy, he's holy, he's holy, he's holy. I need someone to tell me he's holy, right? now. Go ahead and talk to me. Tell me he's holy. Tell me he's 
worthy in the church. You got to talk when you're the king of glory. You got to talk about it. You can't have the king of glory walk into your life and be quiet and be dignified. You've got to say something. He's a king. Jesus has revealed himself to you. The God of the universe has seven billion people, but he chose you. He chooses you to reveal himself to. How can you be quiet? Uh, lift up your voice and give the king of God, the king of God, uh, the king of the universe, the God of glory, praise and worship. He's worthy. Hallelujah. When you see the king of glory, you worship. You worship. You might be suffering right now, but he's still good. You worship. You, got, you might have bills that need to be paid. You still worship. You might have just gotten fired. You still worship. The doctor might have given you a bad report. You still worship. You might be going through all kinds of hell. It does not change his goodness. He still remains good. You worship. That's our response to the king. You not only worship the king, but you serve the king. We present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. This is our act of worship. We serve. Uh, the reason why we bless, the reason why we give, the reason why we get involved, the reason why we love our wife, the reason why we're training our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, the reason why as a single woman of God, you keep yourself holy. You don't make yourself common. Why? Uh, because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and your body is an instrument of righteousness to serve the Lord. Uh, I'm not going to take what is for the service of the Lord and make it common. That's why you don't let people treat you in a common way and you don't accept that as for yourself. And that's not your identity. That's not who you are uh, because you are created to serve him. Uh, whatever the Lord pleases, that's what we do. Uh, which reminds me of the third thing you do when you see the king. Uh, you believe him. You believe him. Uh, when they ask, what shall we do to do the works of God? In John 6, verse 12, 29, Jesus says, believe, 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 believe. You must believe uh, in who he is. You must believe in his goodness. You must believe in his love. You must believe, believe. Uh, we walk by faith. What am I supposed to do? I, I, I'm walking by faith. I'm walking by the word of God. I'm walking trusting. I'm walking confessing the word of God in spite of what I'm going through, in spite of what I feel, I continue to confess. Why? Because I believe the king. I believe who he is. I trust in his mercy. And so you are walking by faith, believe it. It's your response to the king. And finally, uh, what do you, how do you respond? What am I uh, going to do with Jesus? What am I going to do? Uh, I, I, I'm going to get to know him. Uh, you do it in the world, don't you? Whenever you find someone important that's going to help your career, you say, oh, let's, let's exchange. Let's exchange numbers. Oh, we, 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 we might be able to network. We're, what, what's your LinkedIn? You do this, you, you do that in the world. Yet we can leave our Bible and allow it to collect dust. If you knew who he was, you would understand that you don't know anything. And we'll spend all eternity getting to know him. Uh, and you, when you realize you face the king of glory, uh, you've, come in a, you've had an encounter uh, with the word that was made flesh, everything about you, you want to know him. I want to know what he likes. I want to know how he wants me to live. How does he want me to treat my wife? How does he want me to interact with others? How does he want me uh, to serve? Lord, what do you want me to do? I, I, I'm not going to do what I want to do, but I'm going to do what you want. Uh, it says it better in 2 Corinthians 5, verse uh, 15, 14 and 15, 
15, it says, we understand that we were as good as dead. My life was over. I was done. I was a failure. My testimony is an embarrassing one. My testimony, I mean, I went, I was in college. One year, I got straight F, 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 F. I didn't talk about it for years because uh, to talk about it was too painful. It's painful to realize that you're a failure. It's painful to realize that your life amounts to nothing. You don't want to talk about that. Uh, you don't want to admit that. Uh, but here, we're going to tell the truth. Your life is a hot mess without Jesus. Your degrees, your accomplishments mean nothing without him. Paul says, I, I, I count everything. I've gained everything that has impressed others. It's all garbage. It's all mess. It does not mean anything without all people might be impressed about you. But you know in your heart, you are not that impressive. You know in your heart without Jesus, you are nothing. You are hopeless. You are helpless. And so I, 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 I don't know anything. But Paul says with all his accomplishments, he says, what does he say in Philippians 3 verse 10? And I'm closing it down right now. He says that I might know him. May I ignite in the name of Jesus a fire for you to pursue knowledge, the knowledge of him. May I create in Jesus, may at least a spark, may it please almighty God for you to know him as your healer, for you to know him as your provider, for you to know him as your comfort, as your peace, for you to know him, they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Do you know him as the forgiver of your sin? Do you know that your sins, which were many, have been washed and cleansed? Ah, that you might know him, that I might know him and know, I'm going to have to loosen my tie, uh, that I might know him and that I might know the power of the resurrection. In the name of Jesus, I speak uh, prophetically over your life that you're not going to live in darkness another day, but you will have an encounter with the living Son of God, that God will use the foolishness of this preaching to confound the wise. In the name of Jesus, the power of the resurrection can change your life. The power of the resurrection saved not only my life, but my entire family. Uh, I, it's my testimony, so I can tell it. Uh, this is what I encountered. This is how my life was impacted. Hallelujah to Jesus. When my father was 22 years old, he got on his knees and he asked Jesus, Jesus to save him. And when Jesus saved him and not only changed his life, but all of our lives, the course of our lives went in an entirely different direction. That is the power of the gospel. That is the power of the resurrection. It can resurrect your life. Uh, your life needs to be resurrected today. You need to know the power of the resurrection. There is an anointing from God. This is not cunningly devised fables. We haven't made this story up, but there is a power that wherever there is lack in your life, wherever there is need, there is sufficient supply in the power of God to meet you. That I might know him. And that I might know the power of the resurrection. Stand to your feet. Without the power, we're just doing church. Without the power, it's just dead religion. Without the power, no one's saved. No one's life really changes. Everything continues as it was, and it's meaningless and empty. Without the power, well, without the power, you go right back to your life, business as usual, and you continue to get older until you die, and they'll forget about you. Without the power of the resurrection, without the power of the resurrection, your family continues to be on crack or in adultery or drunk or whatever demon that plagues your generation or family, that continues to happen without the power. 
But the gospel we preach is the gospel that transforms lives, a gospel that makes all things new, a gospel uh, that takes a person who is hopeless and helpless and gets all Fs in school and causes that same person who got all Fs uh, to graduate with honors in college. And that's the power of the gospel. That's the power of the resurrection. The resurrection, where do you need resurrection in your life? What are you going to do with Jesus? Let's pray.